began with a bit of a rumble. It could be felt under his feet. And then it just started to rumble. And then the dust started to billow. And for years, the situation that this courageous miner had dreaded was finally coming to pass. His section of the mine that he was in was collapsing. And there was no point in running because the boulders were just too big and the exit was already blocked. He settled back, realizing the situation. And the minutes seemed to quickly turn to hours. It was dark, and it was silent. And he sat there in this time. The silence and the darkness seemed to close in on him, but also, strangely, a companion, and he stared at what must have been the boulders in the rocky wall on the other side. And then, well, he knew his, his friends would be trying to rescue him. They'd be working feverishly and his co-workers, but this section that he was in, it was remote. So after the hours began to wear on, he began to realize and maybe lose some hope. This is not good. But then there was a noise. It was like a tap. It was a tapping. And then there was these boulders beginning to shift and move. And then there was this light, this beam, this thin sliver of an orange, yellowy, white light, and it seemed to pierce through the, through the rocks, and it seemed to come right at him and point right at him. And in a moment, he was up on his feet. Help, he thought, help is coming. And it was pointing right at him, and his heart was in his throat. Help. And he heard this faint voice say, okay, hold on, hold on. Help is coming, but hurry, please. And as the rocks began to shift and there was more noise and more noise on the other side and suddenly there was more light and there was more and it was warm. It felt strange and it was bright and it was shiny. And then came this, this ring and this rope and they began to get this ring through the rock and lower it down and they lowered it towards him and they kept saying, just hold on, hold on, hold on. Grab hold of the ring, came the word. We'll get you out of there. We'll get you out of there. I've talked to many of you over these last weeks and months. Some of you have shared with me the darkness that you have felt. The struggle that you have felt. I have felt it too, occasionally. It can creep up, it can sneak up. And there are those times when it can feel like there is just darkness or just silence and we wonder and we hope we desire rescue but the tricky part about the circumstance that we're in the context the context that we're in right now is that our attention can be on the pandemic or the virus and, and that makes sense because it's uh, it's awful and it's difficult, and there's strain, and there's changes, and people are dying, and people are sick. But there's more going on. 
what we see initially is not all there is. There is also a spiritual battle, a cosmic battle between our creator and the spiritual forces of wickedness. And that battlefield is here on earth and it involves our lives. Our creator wants us to be together and to be in peace. But the enemy The spiritual forces of wickedness are opposed to him, opposed to love, opposed to peace, and that means opposed to us as well. And as part of this, we as human beings are also weak. We are uh, vulnerable. We are susceptible to those uh, the lies and the tricks that the 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 lies that the enemy. gives to us and speaks into us and and the tricks and the way he tries to manipulate and coerce and the world around us is broken sexual brokenness abuse and addictions porn pride prejudice violence We are assailed on a daily basis in manners great and small. And what the world needs, what we need, is to be rescued, to be delivered out of this. But what does that redemption look like? Adam and Eve are first human ancestors had communion with our Creator. They were in fellowship with our Creator in an idyllic setting until they had communion with the devil. And they opened the door to the seeds of wickedness to take root on earth. But the Lord Jesus came near in the garden. But it wasn't long after that that human beings, again, because of the spiritual forces of wickedness and the human uh, nature and proclivity, that humans again found themselves embroiled in corruption and wickedness while our Creator waited patiently. And when finally the sky and earth opened up and and welled with water, the Lord Jesus came near again. Peter in the New Testament describes the ark as being like Jesus. And a family and a segment of creation was rescued and delivered through the waters. God made a promise to Abraham that he would build his family. And Jacob became Israel, and Israel, the family, grew. But then they too found themselves enslaved again in an environment of wickedness in the place of Egypt. But God saw, and he heard, and the Lord came near. And he delivered them out of Egypt again through the baptism waters as though passing through the Red Sea. And so it is with humans and, and, and our creator and the spiritual forces of wickedness. There's this ebb and flow throughout our human uh, history where people reject the Lord or where people go, come in and come out of relationship with our creator hassled and harangued and virtually enslaved at times by spiritual forces of wickedness. And the people already in the Old Testament era, they awaited a king, a special king, an anointed one from God, Messiah, they called him. Prophesied by 
Old Testament prophets, the likes of Isaiah. But they were already experiencing manifestations of this in the Old Testament era of this Messiah. So they recognized and they desired and they longed for deliverance. They longed for redemption. The world needs to be redeemed. And they were expecting a divine king, a specially anointed king, who would get them out of this circumstance that they were in. The question is, what is this divine deliverance, what does this divine redemption look like? So Paul, Paul writing to the church in Galatia, he writes in, to the church in Galatia, Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, he says this, When the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. In the fullness of time, Paul describes to the church in Galatia. And what was that time when God sent his son? What was that time like? It was another time when it was really, really difficult. When the Jews were virtually enslaved. When when Rome had sent puppet leaders that were now in, in Israel and they were governing. It was a horrific time. It was a time when emperors would kill for sport. When Jesus was born, he and his family had to flee for their lives. This was the time. This was the time when God sent his son. Luke describes what happens. Luke describes chapter 2, verses 18. In the region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. Stand up and raise your heads, shepherds. Your Savior, the Messiah, the Lord, has come. Soter, Christos, Kyrios. But it's not what they were expecting. It's not at all what they were expecting. How could this baby, born to such a insignificant, such a low family, in such a low place, possibly be Christos, Curios, Soter. See, there's a disruption here. A disruption to the way people were thinking. And what you see, what we see initially is not all there is. Because if we look closer to what's going on, we see actually what God's real focus and intention is. He came, He sent His Son into a time of extraordinary difficulty, but He came into essentially the heart and center of, of the the difficulty. He came into the place of the poor, of the victim, of the marginalized. 
He came to the epicenter of where the most, he came to the cave, to the, to, to the collapsed mine. To rescue and redeem from the inside out. To rescue from the spiritual forces of wickedness. To speak truth and hope and love and justice. And in the process, uh, deliver from the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes. As Garth was praying, the boast in riches. That's what he came to do. And this baby, this baby Jesus became a man. And after he was tested in the, in the desert, uh, and he began his public ministry, he was, word about him spread all, all through the region. And he made his way back to Nazareth his hometown, and he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath, which was his uh, custom to do. And he stood up. And so, because he stood up, they handed him a scroll to read. They handed him the scroll from Isaiah. And he took the scroll... And he unraveled it, he unrolled it, and he found this section in the scroll of Isaiah. Jesus in the synagogue in his hometown, and he read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll. He handed it back to the attendant. And he sat down and he said, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus is what divine redemption looks like. Jesus is divine deliverance. It has always been Jesus. And now on earth, 2,000 years ago, God made it abundantly, physically, demonstrably clear. Redemption, yes, and in and through the person of Jesus Christ. But... After Jesus rose from the dead, he spent 40 days with people, but then he ascended. But before he ascended, he actually left, he ascended from earth. But before he did, he met with his disciples. And here's the thing, if Jesus is the very real physical uh, work and presence of God's deliverance, of God's redemption, then the challenge is Jesus is leaving earth. He's not here. He's about to leave at the time when he was ascending, so he met with his disciples. And at that time when he met before he was ascending, that is the inauguration of the advent that we are now in. We are in this protracted period of waiting from when God sent his son in the first instance to when he will return again. And we're in this protracted wait time 
but nevertheless full time. And so what was the advice that Jesus gave to his disciples? Knowing that they would begin and commence that time of Advent that we are now in as well. We go back to Luke. Luke 21. Jesus describes when difficulties come, when, when uh, the spiritual fork, uh, forces of wickedness assail you, when there is complexity and danger and there's this sense of urgency and immediacy that is happening. Jesus describes, this is what I want you to do when you see all of this happening and all of this turmoil. He says this in verse 28. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Stand up. Raise your heads. Because your redemption is drawing near. Well, if Jesus is redemption, then what he's saying is stand up and raise your heads because Jesus is drawing near. So here's some things that we we need to, to, to know. Friends, brothers and sisters, the first thing that we need to know about God's divine redemption is that he has a plan and a desire and a will to build his family. It's a promise that he made, and he is faithful, and he will do it. The second thing, friends, that we need to acknowledge is that we cannot rescue ourselves. Redemption is about reclaiming what is yours. So when God says, I am, through Jesus, I am the redemption, I am going to reclaim what is mine. I'm going to take back what is mine. We cannot deliver ourselves, we cannot rescue ourselves. From the spiritual forces of wickedness, they are too complex. It is too difficult a situation. But God can. He hears, he sees, and he comes near. It's a promise. He has, he will, and he will continue. And who the sun sets free is free indeed. And so this Advent season, when you look at the wreath, and you put a wreath on your door, or somewhere of prominence, could it be that you are designating that, yes, We need redemption. Yes, I need redemption. God's promise is that he does this actually. He actually does this. And so we place this wreath with intention, designating that we we recognize that we need redemption and that we desire redemption. And allow him to come near. And not to resist. And he will come near. And it will be, it could be disruptive. It could be not the way you're expecting. It could come at some kind of cost. But there's also an extraordinary need. And if you are feeling discounted, overlooked, alone, or in those moments of darkness, understand that the Lord Jesus is coming near. It's his desire, his will to do. I would like to conclude here in a few minutes, but before I do, I will pause uh, to see if you have any questions. You can text or email your questions to ask at SEMC online. And uh, we will 
uh, get to your questions if you have uh, some now. We would get to those right now to your questions. Uh, if not, then we will get to them in the uh, uh, following days or weeks. We want to return uh, with some commitment to Q&R uh, in January again. Our services are a bit full during this Advent season. But if you have a question, we welcome you to text or email that to us, and we'll make sure to get to that. Friends, difficulties and circumstances, the spiritual forces of wickedness and how we experience life are intertwined. When Jesus read from that scroll in Isaiah and he was saying uh, there would be uh, uh, rescue for the poor, freedom for the captives, it was both literally and figuratively because he did heal, he did come. So the two are intertwined. And this has been our, our, our experience throughout human history. Listen to these words. When God appeared to Solomon in 2 Chronicles 7, the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shout, shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locust to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. There is no way that we can lean in and celebrate redemption unless we are honest. This Advent, like any other, especially this Advent, is a time for us to be honest. We need help. We need rescue. We need deliverance. And a way to honor the Lord is through our honesty. And honesty comes with a confession. A confession that says in so many ways, a confession that, yes, I need help. A confession that, yes, I'm feeling lonely. A confession that says, yes, there's brokenness in my life. A confession that says, yes, I have addictions. A, a confession that says, yes, I've treated people poorly. A confession that says, I am prone to anger or prone to violence. A confession that says, I have an addiction, but I don't want it anymore. A confession that says, I'm in this fallen broken mind right now a confession that says help Dietrich Bonhoeffer Lord Jesus come yourself and dwell with us he prayed be human as we are and overcome what overwhelms us. Come into the midst of my evil. Come close to my unfaithfulness. Share my sin which I hate. And which I cannot leave. Be my brother. Through holy God, thou holy God. Be my brother in the kingdom of evil and suffering and death. Honesty 
confession and prayer. But then, friends, stand up. Stand up and acknowledge that we want to leave those things. We want to put those down and set those aside. That is the confession in the moving from. And then standing up means to be ready to receive and accept what the Lord has. A standing up to put aside and to receive and then raise your heads. Look up and raise your heads. That is the two we are being delivered from and we are being delivered to the Lord. So stand up and set your gaze. Set your gaze not on what is earthly bound, but set your gaze unto the Lord. For those of you who are spellbound, spellbound by troubles, You've turned away from the Lord because of disappointment. Your eyes are heavy with tears. Or maybe you're just weighed down with guilt. Stand up and raise your heads. Our redemption is drawing near.